Welcome to Sunday Talks. Uh, this season of Sunday Talks is called Psalms for the Summer, and tonight is the last episode of this season. We're going uh, through the Psalms uh, as a church uh, each summer, and this summer is Psalm 41 through 50. Uh, again, tonight is Psalm 50. And when I when I think about the summer and about about finishing a series like this one, uh, summer's about to end. Summer is my favorite time of the year. One of my favorite times. I really love it all the seasons, but summer's a great time. Summer days and summer nights and, and just the, the season of the longer days, I think it makes it just a great time of the year until it's over and when it's coming to an end. And I'm always reminded of Jeremiah 8.20 that says the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. And uh, I think it's a great reminder of how we need to deal with the things that are important in life while we have opportunity, particularly our own salvation. And uh, there's nothing worse than, than, than that ending. Summer, summer ending was a sad day for students that w- don't want to go back to school or others whose vacation is going to end. But an even sadder day is to live our life without God and come to the end and not have a personal relationship with Christ. And so uh, I want to encourage you that if you don't know Him personally, that you would come to faith in Christ and turn to Christ. So this series, Psalms for the Summer, I want to make sure that, again, you don't let this pass without having done that before this summer's over with. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 50, and we'll walk through this together. Uh, Before I read the psalm, uh, you'll notice when we start that the heading's a little different than the ones previously. Not all these psalms this summer have been uh, uh, from the sons of Korah, but many of them have been addressed by this group of the sort of the praise band and the choral leaders of the of the uh, uh, of the temple but now as another temple worship leader a man named Asaph uh, wrote this one and he was one of the more prominent songwriters of his day and he writes a very powerful song about the judgment of God and also about judgment and mercy mixed throughout this passage so this is Psalm 50 let me read to you these verses again the heading starts with a psalm of Asaph the mighty one God uh, the Lord speaks and summons the earth From the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before Him is a devouring fire. Around Him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that He may judge His people. Gather to me my faithful ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare His righteousness for God Himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all the moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world in its fullness is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify glorify me. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to recite my statutes and to make my covenant on your lips? Verse 17. But you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with the adulteress. You give your mouth free reign for, for, for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You have thought it, I was like one of, your, one of yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this. Then you you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there will be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. What a powerful passage. There's a lot there. We're going to try to break that down and, and draw upon this for a moment. So the introduction starts with God's coming. There's, God is coming, and, and when He does, and there's this glorious picture of God in the heavens and the fire burning around Him. It's the picture of what we find in other passages in Revelation and other places about the glory of God. The mighty one is coming. And when I read that this morning, again, as I was preparing for this study, I was reminded of that that is our hope as a believer, that God is coming. I mean, you know, what, when we face trials and there's difficulties and setbacks, 
sickness and all kinds of things and that and and ultimately that this world just disappoints us that we have this promise of God that he's coming he says gather my faithful ones who made a covenant with, with me one day we're going home one day the bus is coming and he's going to he's going to he's going to take all of us home and, I, and I, this song came to my mind uh, for those younger ones you won't know this one but but uh, I go back to my childhood and even young adulthood. What a day that will be when Jesus I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, uh, and He'll take me by the hand and lead me through the promised land. What a day. What a glorious day that will be. One day He's coming, and we have that hope, and we don't ever need to lose sight of that. We need to, we need to think about that. That is, that is one thing that the believer has that encourages us and sustains us through difficult times. Our Heavenly Father is going to tell His Son one day, it's time. And Jesus said he doesn't even know when that time is going to be, but the time is going to come, and he's going to come and deliver his people. But he also says for his people, there's going to be judgment. There's, there's judgment for his people now while we're on the earth when we are not where we ought to be with him, walking with him. And so there's judgment. He's going to, he's going to explain that in these verses. It's, it's, and it's oftentimes not based on what they've done, but how they've done it. And that's even true for us. Let's look into what he says in verse 7 and 8. He says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. I am the Lord. I am God, your God. Now, for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. And so he's, he says uh, that, that uh, um, he's, he's, putting, he's going to bring these charges against them. He's going to bring several charges over and over again. And if you were living in this day when, when this was written and, and you, were, you, were, uh, you were in worship service and Asaph says, hey, I'm going to play a new song today, and this is the song he played, and you'd say, wait a minute. You're, play, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. You're, you're singing this song of judgment to God's people, to the faithful ones. We're the ones that are here every Sunday. We come to Sunday school. We tithe, and we give more than a tithe. We, we serve when it's time to serve. We go on mission trips every year. We do all the things that we're supposed to do. And we would, we would, we would look at all that and say, well, how can God say these things? How could this songwriter write a song of God's judgment about His people when, when it seems that they're doing everything they're supposed to do? In other words, they're, they're outwardly doing all the things. But it's just proof that you can outwardly do all the right things and inwardly not have a change in your heart. God goes on to tell them, I don't need your sacrifices. I don't need all these outward things that you're doing. Uh, verses 10 through 13, he says, do, do, you, do you think that, that you can give me something? That there's something that you, real and tangible that you could give me that I would actually need from you? Uh, do, do you think if I were hungry that I would call on you to provide me something to eat? He said, I, I own everything. This is one of those passages that says the cattle on a thousand hills are his. He says, I, I, I know all the birds by name. So when you're sacrificing your birds, it's not like a, I haven't seen them before. That If I wanted one, I couldn't go get one. Uh, that that he, he, is, he is sufficient in himself. He's completely and absolutely sufficient. God, God has no need. And, boy, we need a regular reminder that God doesn't need us. I, I, I remind myself quite often as pastor of this church, God doesn't need me. And if, if, if I had some moral failure, if I were to die... If I just quit and walked away, God would, would be disappointed in me as His servant if I had done something that would cause any of those things. But He's not going to wring His hands because He's got next man up. He's got somebody else that He's going to bring along to serve Him faithfully and do His diligence. And He's going to accomplish His purposes with or without us. The Bible says in Job, His plan cannot be thwarted. And so God's saying, I don't need this. And so the correction he wants to bring to them, he says in verse 14 and 15, he says, here's what you should be doing. You've been offering these sacrifices. Outwardly it looks right, but inwardly there's a heart problem. He says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. It's in that first, that 14th verse. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It was how they were bringing their sacrifice. It was, it was the attitude with which they were, they were coming to God. When you, and when you do it in the right way, God says, call on me and then I will, I will receive it. I want to ask you this question, and, and I, need, I need to be asked this question often, and I ask myself often, not really often enough, are you thankful? Are, are you grateful? Do you express gratitude to others? Do you express gratitude to God? I, I know when, I'm, when, I'm, when I do something for someone, if I give someone something, 
thank you is so powerful to me. I mean, thank you is like, it's like a rocket goes off for me that, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I want to do that some more. And, and I know that God is pleased when we offer thanks to Him and we show gratitude towards Him. And so uh, I want to encourage you with something with a practice that I try to do, and I subtly try to do it. And maybe you've, maybe you, maybe you've talked to me, and maybe you catch on to what I'm, I'm doing. I hope you do because I, I, want it, I want you to practice it in your own life. When someone complains, and I know you probably can't believe that in a Baptist church anyone ever complains to the pastor about anything, but when someone's complaining about something that I think is probably not what we ought to be focused on, and that's typically what we complain about are things that, that we can't change or things that don't maybe necessarily need to be changed or that are not the big picture things, I try to, as quickly as I can, divert the conversation to things that we should be grateful for, things that God's blessed us with. And, and uh, I keep a running list for myself of 10 things that, that here's what I'm grateful for today. And I try to keep that changing, otherwise it would kind of get stale and, and I wouldn't maybe be as appreciative as I should. And so at least, at least a, on a weekly basis, I try to go back and look at my list and say, you know, I need, to, I need to be grateful for this because I will forget too often. And so just here's some things that I wrote down today. My salvation, I, that, that should never get old, that, that I'm thankful that God saved me by His grace. I'm thankful for this church family. Um, and if you, ever, if you ever just begin to neglect your church, the, your church family, maybe just go back to your directory. Maybe just look through the, the Sunday school list of your class. Uh, uh, I, I keep a prayer list that has the deacons and the, the committees that I work with. I, I, on my prayer list is, is every member of the search committee that was on the search committee called me. Thankfully, they're all still in the church, and, uh, but I pray for them every week. I'm, I, they're part of my family. I appreciate that. I'm thankful for my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my, my, fam, my personal family and what they mean to me. I'm thankful for new believers in the church. And what, how, they, how they bless the church and their enthusiasm. I'm thankful for IMB missionaries on the field that uh, are serving right now. And it uh, just makes me grateful to know that the sacrifice they make. I'm thankful for our home, that uh, i got a place to put my head down at night and just the blessings of, of where we live. I'm thankful for our staff, our church staff. Eric is, is sitting here. By the time this thing airs, he's going to be in Texas somewhere. And uh, it's, a, it's a little bit sad for me to, today to be filming this ahead of time. And, and, uh, but I'm thankful for everyone that God's called to serve here with us and, and the opportunity I have to serve with them and how they've been a blessing to our church. I'm thankful for Wednesday nights. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, last night we heard, when we were recording this on a Thursday, but last night we heard a testimony of one of those new believers. And uh, that's all I need for, that's, that's like uh, protein and, and caffeine and everything that I need for the day. And then I'm thankful for my friends. Uh, regularly, I'll get a call from a friend. Somebody, somebody. It's like, who can you count on when, when you're, you know, who's the person you'd have in a foxhole with you if you're in that situation, or who's the person that that uh, you would call on in in times of need, or they would call on you. Those are ten things I'm thankful for. That gets my mind off of whatever else I was focused on that didn't matter, and and not that I'm just thankful to them, but that that I want to make that connection that this came from God. God provided all these things. As He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, He owns my home. He owns this church. He, he owns the people that I just mentioned to you. And so uh, we, we need to be grateful. Uh, thanks for giving me a time to make that focus. But then He goes on to say, okay, if, you, if we don't have that attitude of gratitude, then in, in chapter 50, He says there's going to be judgment. And he's, again, He's not switching themes. He's not talking about a different group of people. This judgment is for His people. This is not the judgment for the, the nations, for the pagans. This, he's, he doesn't change the context. The tone doesn't change, he's, he's, but he's talking about his own people. He says in verse 17, You hate discipline. You cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him. Uh, you give your mouth free reign for evil. You're saying things you shouldn't say. Your tongue frames deceit. You speak against your brother. You slander your mother's son, your, your, own, your own brother. So he says, you're doing all these things as my children, as followers of Christ, as believers. He's calling out their sins, the things that they're guilty of, and saying, here's what you've been doing, and you're, you're, you're going to have to give an account for this. And here's what, here's what they say. And this is what we sometimes say about the world out there when we see the world living in a way that's not pleasing to God or differently than what God would have. We, we ask questions like this. Why doesn't God do something about that? Why doesn't God? Why didn't God straighten those folks out? Why, did, why does God let them keep on going? Why didn't God 
just wipe them out? Why didn't God discipline them for what they've done? And God's not talking about those people. He's talking about us. And maybe you've even seen this maybe with somebody's rebellious child. I've said this. I'm, I'm an old man. I'm a grandpa too. But I'll see a toddler, somebody just having a fit, you know, in the grocery store or at a restaurant. I'm thinking, why don't they take that kid out? You know, why, why don't they just take them outside? I don't mean beat them, but just why don't they discipline that situation? And I don't know the whole situation. Maybe, maybe they're tired. Maybe they're just being gracious. And God, as he looks at his own children, he's being gracious to us. He's being patient with us. But he says in verse 21, these things you have done, and I've been silent. I've not said anything. And you thought that because I didn't say anything that I was just like you, that I was, I was basically condoning what you were doing, that I was okay with it, and uh, that I was approving of what you were doing. But then he goes on to say in, ver- in, the, next, in the next verse, or look at verse, uh, the second part of verse 21. He says, But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. And he says, Mark this down. Then you who forget God, lest I tear you apart, and there's nothing left to deliver. You... you God's saying, I'm going to humble you. I'm going to judge you. And if, and if you don't turn back to me, I'm going to rip apart everything you have. L- listen, there's a, there's a word for every believer, every child of God, every church that's not doing what God wants us to do. The God says, if I have to, I'll destroy you to get your attention. I will destroy everything about you in order to, to deal with you and deal with you. And I think that's a word for our nation. God's been silent a long time. He's, he's let things go a long time. And we wonder... Why doesn't God do something about this? One, one day He will. The answer is that God hasn't spoken yet. God won't be silent forever. Judgment Day is coming. The, the, R.G. Lee, the famous pastor of Bellevue many years ago, said payday is coming. Payday someday. And God, God could have ended this song on that note of judgment. And he would have been perfectly fine to do that. It would have been acceptable because He's God. But He ends this with grace extended yet again, even, even to those of His own that are wicked. Verse 23, uh, He says... The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the way of salvation. He extends grace one more time. And I believe God's delay in judgment for his people then, and his delay in judgment for for you, his delay in judgment for me, for this nation, is because God's extending grace one more time. God is the most gracious Father I've ever known. And yet, at the same time, he he is just... And he has punishment and he deals, he corrects his children. The Bible says he punishes and corrects those that he loves. But his, his delay in that judgment is only because he's extending grace. What, what a great psalm. Uh, I, have, I have to admit, I don't think I've ever, I've ever preached or done a Bible study on Psalm 50, but I will do another one. This, is, this has been a great one. And I've had a great summer with you going through these. If, if, if you haven't finished this, if, if you just caught this one, I would encourage you to go back and look at all 41 through 50. Maybe you can even go back and go back to, to earlier ones that we did uh, when we started recording these last year. Uh, but it's hard to believe five summers. This is the fifth summer that we have done these. We're concluding the, the, summer, the songs for the summer tonight. But we're not concluding Sunday talks. Uh, we have continued to do this for a while, and Lord willing, we're going to continue this on. Most likely, we'll take next week off, and we won't have a version. That'll be a great time for you to catch up if you need to do, to do that. And then that's August 22nd, and then on August 29th, August 29th um, we're going to start a new series, and you're going to have a different person doing that for that series. I'm, I'm not leaving forever to do that, but I wanted you to have this opportunity to get to know Rox Horton, our new discipleship pastor, better. Um, we're still working out the details. In fact, I just talked to him before we came in here this morning, and uh, I wanted you to hear from him. I want you to hear his heart. Uh, I don't. Again, I'm not sure exactly what format we're going to be doing that in. If he's going to have guests, it's going to be him personally, but you're going to be blessed. I know that, that he will be diligent in what he prepares, and uh, it'll be a great few weeks of that series, and we'll tell you more about that as time goes on. And I'm very excited to see that happen, and I appreciate you supporting this, sharing this with others. And again, thank you for Sunday Talks. Thank you, Eric, for all you've done for us on this, and uh, hope you have a great week, and we'll see you soon.